A very warm welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our virtual meetup titled CBPR Recap 2020. My name is Saurabh Kumar, and I'm on the marketing team here at H2O.ai. I'd love to start off by introducing our speaker. Sayyam Bhutani is a machine learning engineer and an AI content creator at H2O.ai. He is also an Inc. 42 Economic Times recognized machine learning practitioner. Sayyam is also an active gaggler, where he is a master. Sayyam is also the host of a very popular Chai Tan Data Science podcast, where he interviews top practitioners, researchers, and gagglers. Without further delay, I'd now like to hand it over to Sayyam. Thanks so much, Saurabh. Let me quickly share my screen. Yeah. Is my screen visible to everyone? Should be, I can see it. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Saurabh, for the introduction. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining on a Saturday or Friday evening. Before I dive into my slides, I'll just like to do a quick walkthrough of the website, uh, the CVPR website. So CVPR happened right around um, June uh, this year. Uh, there weren't many presentations that were made available after the conference concluded. So instead of that, I'd like to point you out to another website where you can find all of the papers. So I'm just pointing this out in case you'd like to go back, explore all of these papers. You can find these on this website. So this website is by Matt Dietke. That's his name. And it's mattdietke.com slash cvpr-2020. If you go on here, you can find all of the papers formatted according to different topics. You can pick them up. You can search for them. You can find all of them. I picked a bunch. I'll just dive into that. If, if you'd like to go back and find your interest, pick them. Please go to this amazing website. And another resource that I'd like to point out, we at S2O are also launching. We've just launched a course and we'll also be doing hopefully a few follow-ups with that. So if you'd like to Join our community or join those courses, please navigate to h2o.ai slash community. And you'll be able to find the links to join our community or sign up for the course. Okay. So um, CVPR 2020 recap. Before I do that, I'd like to talk about h2o.ai for a quick minute. The goal of our company h2o.ai is to democratize AI. Uh, this is a community event. We like to do a lot of community events. And uh, last week we had, uh, last month, sorry, we had done a ICLR recap, which went well. We'd like to continue the series. So again, if you like this, please let us know. We like to do more paper summaries, more academic coverage. A quick snapshot of a few numbers. If you, if I could point you to the meetup members, we're close to 180,000. So uh, as you can expect, we do have a good community, a strong community. Please feel free to join that. Uh, quite a few universities are, are are in our partner program as well. And the thing that excites me the most about Chai Time Data Science is I interview a lot of Kaggle heroes. We have quite a few of them, so I get to interview them uh, during my work hours which is really exciting, but you can also catch them uh, in a few of our events. These keep happening. So please keep an eye out on the pages from where you signed up. And again, uh, the goal of our products broadly is to make your company an AI company. If you'd like to check, check out more about that, uh, feel free to navigate to our website or please feel free to find me online anywhere. I am, I'm pretty active on any platform. I tweet every five minutes. I'd be more than happy to engage with you. So what exactly is CVPR and what is the agenda of this meeting? Uh, CVPR stands for Computer Vision and Pattern Recognition Conference. It's one of the go-to conferences, it's one of the most recognized conferences for computer vision, one of the elite conferences, if I may. The agenda for today is I'll try to cover six broad papers. I'll just dive into how I selected these. And uh, as a disclaimer, I am not a researcher. So these are more to give you a taste of different interesting tangents that I curated that I found interesting so that you can pick up on those. And uh, in an hour's presentation, I might not be able to do justice to all of these topics. 
so if you'd like to dive into depth please feel free to find me in our community slack uh, i'll be more than happy to discuss either uh, one of these papers or dive into depth into any other one I, i've read quite a few of these and um this is this is going to be an interactive session so please feel free to leave your questions we might take a few in between or towards the end uh, we'll see how how i progress uh, with the summaries so again uh, this uh, was the website uh, luckily it was a virtual conference this year so it was more easy to engage with the researchers more easy to find people everyone was on a zoom call which was interesting uh, if you didn't get a chance uh, you can still find the papers still engage with different people in the computer vision community i found it one of the most open and welcoming communities so the paper summaries for today uh, we had close to 1400 more than 1400 around 1500 submissions for cvpr which is quite a big number uh, i picked papers based on my personal interest my own curiosity uh, which sort of go on different tangents all of the time papers for today include a few interesting deployment discussions adversarial attacks so if you're familiar with gans generative adversarial networks this is not exactly that this is when you try to attack a machine learning model that's in production that's hosted on a website that you're trying to ship to your customers so uh, that's another topic that i tried to pick from these presentations gans generative adversarial networks there were quite a few interesting uh, different tangents from these as well along with domain transfer so the thing that's exciting about domain transfer is in 2020 we have a lot of papers already we have a lot of pre trained models already how do we utilize that instead of not creating something new and that's that's what's exciting for industry in my opinion how do you take a pre trained model and utilize it in the most optimized way so domain transfer for different applications for uh, knowledge distillation for trying to grab the knowledge the latent knowledge generated in a gan applied to another one speed up the training all of these neat little tricks if if you try to compare a parallel with it um if you if we look at how phone manufacturers do these little incremental changes that over the years account to big different change that's that's what uh, these papers are about although the tricks are pretty significant and uh, they are pretty interesting so that's how i picked these papers uh, this is one of my favorite quotes from fefeli who's one of the leaders in computer vision uh, she is the creator one of the creators of imagenet no one tells a child how to see especially in the early years they learn through real world examples and that's that's a end goal end game of computer vision to replicate human vision we know we're close to that someone might argue that hey we've beaten humans at imagenet accuracies but that's that's not the real world these these models are still very brittle still in the early days i would argue for both for academia and research so the first paper it's titled uh, from paris to berlin discovering fashion style influences around the world yes discovering fashion style influences and just to re reiterate all of these papers you can find the links on the meetup page and most of the images here are from the papers uh, if you'd like to find them so this paper is by ziad al hala at all um i just like to point out this graph if you look closely and if you blink twice you might be able to get a read of it uh if you ever try driverless ai it's, this is one of the graphs that driverless might point you to what we're trying to do is associate how different fashion trends connect between different cities across the world so fashion trend that appears in paris how soon how slowly does it iterate towards other cities in what format does it do that and how long does it do that uh, for how long is the influence sustained 
fashion is is an interesting industry in its own i i know very little about it but this paper was pretty interesting dive into that so fashion style influences how do we discover and quantify fashion influences how do you put that into a matrix into a vector how do you detect which cities influence each other and followed by that the authors also try to forecast trends and influence they try to model influences between different cities so they use an interesting data set uh, for this most of this is based on a people's data set where they try to quantify uh, different features based on these images so colors of the clothing the outfits how vibrant are those shapes of the outfits outfits can be pretty fancy can be pretty normal uh, depends on which which month are we looking at which calendar month so uh, the approach is pretty straightforward they try to note down which cities follow a trend and how much of a lag is there between that trend appearing in a city followed by that trickling into another one as you might expect um let's say a trend in in if we talk about india specifically if some weird trend appears in new delhi some fashion clothing trend appears in cr area would be the first to pick it up regions around would pick it up eventually and slowly it will trickle into different parts of the nation you could argue the same about uh, trends in paris that might trickle into different european countries with time another interesting thing that the authors try to model is uh, re recording past trajectories so how has this happened in the past and uh, using this as a data point to predict the spatio temporal influences around the world uh, how does this trickle into space and time uh, around the world so again uh, if if you try to look closely here as expected european cities do have a good amount of influence between each other so these chords essentially try to map the influence from one city to another paris uh, influences quite a bunch of cities if you look at figure b istanbul london milan barcelona same for european cities there is quite a good amount of connect to my surprise asian uh, regions also have quite a good uh, impact on each other if you look towards the right uh, there is another interesting plot by the authors which tries to summarize how much does a city exert influence to others generally speaking how much does it receive influence how much is a city influenced by others and how much is the net of that to my surprise one of uh, these few cities in the middle um, i believe dhaka and a few others have minimal influence from the outside world so that's that's interesting uh, that's an interesting point to note another one was uh, and this this was to my surprise that asian cities do exert a good amount of influence on each other which at least to, due to some bias that i had was counterintuitive to me so where, where is the computer vision happening in this to summarize uh, these fashion trends aren't just uh, predicted based just on excel sheets it's actually uh, modeling of the different vision uh, aspects of clothing that help the authors do that it's it's long term forecasting using naive models so not naive quite literally in the sense but naive in terms of probability uh, for my non statistical background friends and uh, per city model so the authors actually try to use different time series modules different time series models arima models as well profit models as well and uh, using if i remember correctly around 26 different points 26 different time series points they try to forecast this influence and uh, this leads them to modeling city to city influence 
at an individual basis city to the world influence and uh, bringing up different interesting correlation and dynamics that come along with it so that was the first paper for the second one uh, this one is titled query efficient boundary based black box attack this is by hui chin li at all if if i go back a few minutes i i'd mention about uh, attacking your machine learning model um, so once you have this in production and for many businesses the model is is the secret sauce um, it's it's part of their secret recipe uh, that they have up somewhere part of what they sell you'd like to keep it safe you'd like to keep it uh, away it might be your intellectual property so you wouldn't want others to replicate it but as expected people will try to replicate it so there are different formats of attacks that happen uh, this was quite an interesting topic uh, that got a lot of coverage in icml as well that will get coverage in icml iclr as well both of these conferences so the two different types of attacks are a white box white box attack is when uh, the attacker is aware of your entire model so they know what's going in what's going out they know roughly about the nitty gritty details of it the second one is black box so uh, if i am an attacker i know nothing about what you put up let's say as an api so how i'd like to uh, let's say attack that is uh, just sending a large number of queries and getting the outputs and if you try to reverse engineer that they'll give you an idea of if you if you can get a hold of what goes in and what comes out of a model you'll essentially have replicated uh, the data set so you'll have the labels and data set with you that uh, using which we can uh, again create a similar model why would you even bother with all of that effort in terms of uh, efficiency in terms of cost efficiency uh, there was an interesting analysis maybe not in this uh, paper in another paper that that actually showed that doing these attacks is actually much 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 cheaper compared to other uh, research r and d efforts uh, i don't know if you ever i i am sure every one of us has uh, selected those image uh, blogs as as the new captcha uh, irritating model <laughs> irritating module if if you would have noticed those uh, have gotten more irritating of course uh, very irritating but they're also coming with different uh, noisiness in them those are actually adversarial noise if if you ever look closely and those usually appear if you try to navigate to a website multiple times those are not for you you can uh, clearly see through them but those are very harmful for models so again attackers try to attack literally everything and if you navigate to these website these little disturbances are enough to disrupt a model to take it uh, to make its predictions go completely haywire so your model could go uh, this is a fish where it should be a cat uh, this is an example from this paper this is this has quite serious uh, influences this has uh, been shown to affect self driving cars so if you could figure out the right amount of adversarial noise printed on a article printed on uh, some physical piece uh, the car the physical uh, car self driving car might not even uh, recognize the particular thing as an object so it's pretty important to understand how the dynamics of this work so talking about uh, this this is not the dynamics of general attacks this is the dynamics of kiba and uh, these are based on final predictions uh, this is if i go back to the title efficient uh, boundary based attacks right if it it wouldn't be efficient if it's just a large number of attacks being done on the model to reduce the number of queries sampling is done from 
spatial frequency and intrinsic components after sampling so the authors try to figure out some smart way to sample this this is of course a very simplified explanation of that but if you look at uh, the query model and the estimation process they try to sample through a representative subspace create these perturbation vectors and try to add that noise try to perturb that input image and finally send the query and using that they try to estimate the gradients uh, in the demonstration section now again uh, usually i don't cover a lot of uh, detailed result values for these papers since we slightly one month late about summarizing these papers and field moves pretty fast so what i am trying to cover in these summaries is the tricks the overview of the architectures instead of the different values so uh, the authors actually experiment on celeb a and imagenet data set and they try to attack face plus plus and azure uh, which are public facing apis uh, public facing uh, models that you can test and they, these uh, attacks are pretty efficient for the same to summarize there are three optimization approaches to reduce queries spatial frequency and intrinsic components um, the more you sample from these selectively essentially you reduce uh, your queries by a larger magnitude which results in more optimal estimation over the complete space and these are these re reveal quite good examples against online and offline apis now coming to more interesting more uh, fascinating uh, papers relatively if if you're on twitter you might have seen those time lapses that uh, convert a celebrity to even an animal one celebrity as an input to another one actress to an actor using just scans quite a few of these at least in the last few months must have been through stargan uh which is stargan v2 which is diverse image synthesis for multiple domains um if you could just look, look closely i'd like to point out that the first column here is the input these are the generated outputs essentially the, just the first column is the input and everything else is in generated outputs now of course these are uh, cherry picked results but if you can appreciate uh, how much diversity is there in these images uh, if you if you ever try to train a can model on collab or anywhere it's it's pretty difficult to get diverse images out of it that that are um, semantically correct so uh, it 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 should look like a human face it should have the right characteristic it should look like a cat should look like a dog so uh, if you look at this cat for example i am not a cat person so let's let's look at the lion instead um the expressions if you look closely are pretty similar to the source image which is difficult to achieve uh, if you try to appreciate uh, this paper now this is of course not the first paper to do this this is again incremental changes incremental improvements over the previous ones so the problem statement is image to image translation uh, language to language uh, translation sequence to sequence translation is where we try to go from one let's say language to another which is the foundation of lstm foundation of uh, deep learning based nlp if we take that to image to image translation going back to again the original uh, results uh, we're trying to translate these input images to all of these output images uh, while ensuring diversity in generated images now these these look pretty human like images but uh, if you look closely they are diverse the features at least for all of these persons are are pretty different uh, which is why uh, the second point which is ensuring diversity and you like this to be scalable over multiple domains 
so the authors have shown that you can take a cat image convert it to a dog image with similar features similar expression convert that to a tiger image even a leopard and actually taking a human face take towards an animal like output as well the trick or uh, the gist at least the interesting part to me was using two different modules with some fiddling which is a mapping network and a style encoder note that all gans have an encoder and decoder a generator and a discriminator uh, they the authors here use a different style encoder this is the overview of the framework again if you look slightly closely uh, there are four steps to it the generator takes the input and and style as an input gives you the, gives you the output sorry so you're translating an input image into an output image reflecting domain specific style specific outputs followed by which you take a mapping network that transforms a latent code a vector essentially into style codes over different domains so again i'd like to highlight this point this is able to do it over different domains these multi heads are shared between different networks because we we're trying to go from cat to dog to lion to leopard so i'd like to generate different styles using that the style encoder followed by which uh, the style encoder extracts the style code and the generator will perform reference guided image synthesis which will essentially allow us to generate uh, whatever target domain image we're trying to get to again the trick one one another trick here is using ada in in the generator um these are very broad terms again to remind you you can look these up uh, i'm trying to give you a general sense of these papers if you're not familiar with these uh, that's completely fine please feel free to find me after or uh, feel free to raise that question uh, for the q and a section so that's that's the gist of the framework of how this works uh i'd like to again highlight a bunch of results uh, the authors have done a few comparisons of their methods against the other methods that are doing this so the first column here is the source image uh this i think uh, fourth column sorry i'm not trying to zero index count it the fifth column is the star gan output same for the next one what i'd like uh, to highlight here is if you look at the source and the output images look how closely the expressions are also resembled while translating the features same for even wildlife right this cat has the exact same expression as this dog whereas uh, the other efforts aren't effective over these different techniques these different latent guided synthesis on animal or on celeb a data sets and uh, some even fail at different semantic generations which means that these images don't exactly look like what they supposed to look which is which is a problem with cans and again this is a slight improvement in that direction this gives more guided more semantically meaningful images images that make more sense in in more simple words another one of the results um uh, again this this image is from the paper uh, we we're, were able to generate somewhat looking adam levine <laughs> what what's happening here is we take a source image we give it a reference that guides the generation and this is the image that it comes up with so again the features of the reference are being transformed onto the source image some sort of style transfer uh, not really but that's, that's an easier explanation of it so the features get mapped onto the source image while retaining uh, the details of the source image so again all of the features all of the expressions are retained uh, 
this brave tiger has the exact same gaze as this nervous kitty over here uh, the same angle to her face uh, same expression similar expressions not uh, so much for this dog but that's all right so they did essentially two different things to appreciate here which is we're able to guide this generation and as well as retain it over different domains so style code is set to summarize style code is separately generated per domain if you look back a few slides towards the network and this is from learned transformations so first we try to map the transformations which essentially gives them more flexibility and the shared part of module learns domain invariant features which means these different heads essentially it's it's a bunch of uh, matrix vectors right these eventually learn about domain invariant features which essentially allows us to better guide these induce regularization uh, create better images essentially okay in interest of time i'll just move the i'll we'll do a q and a towards the end uh, i'll just try to summarize the papers first so uh, this is actually a data set it's not an architecture uh, which is already also interesting we we're still seeing some very interesting papers coming up i had the opportunity to interview dima damen who's created kitchens 100 which is a very interesting uh, computer vision data set i don't think if uh, that was from cvpr but that's also something you should look up um, kitchens hyphen 100 is the name of that data set this one is oasis which stands for a large scale data set for single image 3d in the wild single 3d image in the wild even though we have image net even though we have kitty k i t t k i t t t i kitty which is for optical flow problems or selvengar problems or related architectures and both of these are argu arguably one of the go to data sets uh, these essentially don't make it to other uh, interesting don't contribute to other interesting research which is uh, object detection related works uh, or 3d mapping uh, where for example you'd like to do mapping based on a 2d image so like the video stream you're getting from this from my webcam is a 2d image but if you'd like to do mapping of these features how would you do that using a 2d image so you'd need some more uh, data you need to figure out different architectures and for all of that research you need human annotators you need more data sets you need to create a uh, rich information before uh, enabling the research in a sense so this is uh, the process through which this data set has been generated the authors created framework essentially a ui that allows you to label these images that allowed uh, the annotators to label these images and they create 140000 images which is not a lot right you you might think oh imagenet is bigger than that but to appreciate it uh, imagenet images are just classified into different bins different classes which arguably takes just a few seconds the authors i think they pointed out in this paper uh, annotating every single image takes close to 5 minutes after training uh, the annotator so this is not a task that uh, someone without training could do very efficiently so this essentially allows us to reconstruct these images map pixel depths and reconstruct pixel wise depth as well the features that have been provided by the authors for all of the images in this data set is Uh, occlusion boundary i'm just going to go over these uh, since these are somewhat common in in 3d data sets fold boundary surface normal so uh, planar normals i would say to a surface a 90 degree horizontal plane or vertical plane to a surface relative depth relative normal and planarity if uh, 
the object is in a plane or not. This essentially helps solving different sorts of uh, computer vision problems. So you could take, you could utilize all of these depending on the use case or just one of these for your problem. The process of creation, this is uh, the UI screenshot that the authors had shared. This is what the annotator gets. They select a view, they try to select a polygon and followed by which they try to annotate 3D properties of the objects. This is quite fascinating, right? We're still in 2020 and still figuring out how to generate more data sets. And uh, this is one of the interesting insights onto into how much of effort is still uh, there to generate 3D related data sets, which is what uh, we need for the real world, which is what we need for most of the use cases for these uh, models this computer vision field to work better in the real world i would argue it's also possible using 2d images but this is also an interesting direction so it's it's fascinating to look into this process as well at least for me uh one of the unique sections in a paper uh, at least the first time that i've ever come across is uh, quality control which is pretty much required for creating this data set so how do they do this they they're not following gradient student descent. They're not doing that. They actually have hired workers who are first trained, evaluated, and if they pass the evaluation only, then they're allowed to annotate their data set. And a separate verification of the meshes is also extracted and done. And only these, these meshes, these points, this data set, if it's good enough, then it makes towards the final collection of 140,000 images. So it's a total of 140k 3D depth annotated single images in the wild from any scene, uh, which is what wild means here. 31% uh, of these are actually from a third party vendor. The authors had hired a third party vendor and the remaining are from Amazon Mechanical Turk. They trained an R glass and Resonate D, Resonate Depth models and these are evaluated on benchmarks uh, it is shown that this is an interesting problem at least to maybe create some pre-trained models or uh, do some interesting uh, research so wh why did i just talk about a data set one of the most interesting contribution a practitioner could make to academia is just create a new sota which is for what uh, for that all you need to do is just train a model figure out a few details this is not to dumb down any uh, interesting architecture, but at least in the early days of any data set, you could easily hold the state of the art for a few days, few weeks, few months. So uh, please feel free to find this data, try to beat a benchmark, try to hold the highest benchmark if you'd like to do that. Uh, this is an, again, another interesting paper based on attacks. It's titled, One Man's Trash is Another Man's Treasure. Uh, no, I didn't pick the paper just because of the title. It had a lot of interesting details. Resisting adversarial examples by adversarial examples. Yes, the title is repeated. Uh, so this sort of would give you a deja vu, but we just talked about attacking models where we discussed uh, how fiddle, how brittle uh, it, it these models really are and it's pretty easy to fiddle with them break them uh, there, there are many examples many grave news that has also come out of it authors suggest embracing the presence of uh, these attacks so instead of trying to create examples to avoid it they actually train the model on these examples let me walk you through it if you look at the architecture towards the right, they're using a pre trained model, which before feeding the input to our model, that is before even training our model that we'd like to deploy, they actually introduce adversarial noise into the image. So the model sort of becomes agnostic to it in, in a way. Why would you like to train another model when you're already training another model? This is a pre-trained model. They don't tune it. They don't train it. They don't fine tune it. 
so it's it's slightly computationally cheap uh, there's not a lot of added over, overhead i would argue that is a broad overview of it but again an interesting aspect from this paper was the authors also try to play devil's advocate which means they also try to attack their own technique that helps prevent attacks uh, which is again an interesting insight to find in papers uh, still compared to the general stream they tried different attacks and uh, it's shown that their approach is most resilient to all of these to bpda attacking gradient free attacks white box attacks and black box attacks i'm not going to dive into these details uh, i am happy to discuss them later or please feel free to look them up again an interesting uh, word they show the best worst case robustness best worst case robustness so they are the most robust even under attack on cfa 10 and tiny imagenet which are surely uh, data sets for examples but it's fascinating to see that uh, they do quite good job at that i think this would be the last paper that i'd like to summarize before diving into qna uh, i might skip another one so universal source free domain adaptation domain adaptation is using the knowledge of one domain adapting it towards another this paper sort of shows us how to do that universally for different problems or at least broadly speaking so to introduce the problem uh, we're trying to use a labeled source data set and transfer that knowledge to a target quite literally transfer learning right the fact here is uh, the different or the twist here in this paper is uh, it's unsupervised domain adaptation in absence of source data so there is no source data there is no uh, category gap knowledge essentially we're trying to generalize it we're trying to make it universal these logs indicate that there's not a connect happening so how do we transfer knowledge of class separability from a labeled source domain to unlabeled in presence of a domain shift to transfer that to english uh, how do we take an image trained on let's say animals generalize it to cars and the author suggests a two step learning process i dive into that another interesting insight here was defining a different ob objective which is source similarity matrix so talking a bit more about domain adaptations uh, this is let's say example of a closed set this is a partial set uh, where they include overlap a bit for the original data set uh, and the target data set and this is an open data set where the, if you look closely the boundaries are undefined for the outer data set the universal one is where you don't have enough knowledge about the general uh, domains to which you're trying to transfer to the problem with these is not the paper but generally they try to over generalize for regions they haven't seen so if you're trying to generate images or if you're trying to classify them they might over generalize for different regions and most approaches don't work well with source free settings so if you don't have a lot of source data set how do you apply that knowledge if you're trying to transfer a tiger onto a seahorse uh, and use that knowledge towards target private images which is you trying to generate a zebra how do you do that sorry a giraffe this is the author's approach so the proposed approach uses two stages first one is procurement and deployment the classical approach is not using any class boundaries uh, the insight for me was they do negative sampling which is they try to create uh, negative examples for the input if you look at the architecture now these might be very detailed examples uh, but again if you like to explore it please feel free to find the paper if you look at the architecture they've simulated negative samples 
using the repository samples and the architecture has two stage models so procurement and deployment and the source similarity metric is actually used in the procurement stage and while while doing the procurement this not defined boundaries so the there's not negative sampling happening which allows a good amount of overlap and while procuring uh, the separability for different classes is introduced what all of these terms uh, represent is when we're trying to create negative samples we don't worry too much if we're creating a class that makes sense or not but when we're trying to deploy it when we're trying to generate the images let's say the authors introduce a metric to create boundaries between these so the procurement stage aims to exploit the knowledge of the separability if we introduce separability here uh, it should be fairly straightforward to pick an example from the generated ones and using a well designed learning objects we can uh, use utilize the source similarity creation effectively so these images that we had created can be used more effectively i think i will skip this paper in, in interest of the q and a but i could go back to it um so that's that's a very quick overview of all of these papers thanks for tuning in and i'd like to open up to any questions that you might have yes thank you sayam uh, let's get into questions uh, number one would be would be good to know how computer vision and nlp are enhancing the area of intelligent automation there, there's so many different tangents right uh, if you have a alexa i'm not trying to trigger, trigger anyone's speakers but if you have the smart speakers at home uh, that's one interesting this uh, if if we try to combine these right uh, many different car manufacturers I am being a generic. Uh, I'm giving a generic example, but if you can interact with your cars, uh, Teslas have shown this. Uh, that's quite literally there in the real world. But to to me, uh, the more interesting ones would be where you can use this uh, in more real time with computers. So uh, different examples uh, would be using Siri while working on something. So that, that that's that's a very broad answer. The next question: Will computer vision be able to provide smooth three D people, as in real world, in the AR during daytime, or will it fluctuate the pixels like in other AR technologies? That's that's a great question. It's it's also so there there are two aspects to it. When you're trying to generate, uh, when you're trying to model people into an uh, augmented reality uh, environment a it's computationally expensive which means that if you don't have good hardware uh, it might flicker it might not give you the best results uh, can computer vision help uh, this year actually uh, this was one of the papers that i had selected that couldn't make it to today's presentation uh, which is, the title of that paper is uh, generating 3d people in occluded environments so it's it's actually shown that this can be done effectively even in this this year's CVPR. Uh, so the short answer is yes. The broad answer is uh, please look at that paper. Thank you. Question for the adversarial paper: Does adding adversarial samples from QEBA or Kiba to a network and then retraining make it more difficult for FGSM to work? I am not familiar with FGSM, so I'll have to uh, check that and get back to the person. Please feel free to find me uh, in our community. Thank you. Can you give some more examples of intrinsic perspective? This is with respect to. OK, we need more context. Uh, attendee, <laughs> if you are still here, uh, please follow up on your question. Next, we have what particular ML AI techniques were used? Any hint on how they structured the data to feed into training algorithms? I assume this relates back to a particular paper. 
but do you want to take a stab at it? Sure. So different papers follow different approaches. Uh, the GANs, uh, the, the most interesting, the most fascinating aspect to me was for GANs, they're not trying to fiddle a lot with the input images. Uh, they're just trying to tweak the architectures more. Usually you'd like to filter your data into a certain format before feeding into a network. Now the shift, general shift is, you're trying to make your architecture, your model more generic to real world. So instead of expecting a certain output, you're trying to make your outputs uh, more agnostic, more generalizable uh, to the real world. So for most of the papers I picked, there wasn't a lot of tweaking done. Thank you. Next question. About the STAR GAN V2 paper, it seemed to me that the baseline approaches are doing a decent job in generating diverse variations of the input images. And instead, they are mainly having problems with generating real life likely images. What component of the proposed network would be the one responsible for obtaining this improvement in the likelihood of images? Long question. That's a great question. Uh, so if if you go back to the architecture, they actually introduced a multi-head uh, generator, which actually tries to encode these different domain knowledges. So essentially what latent knowledge, I'm throwing a lot of jargon out there because it's, it's, a, it's a theoretical question, but the knowledge picked up by those hidden weights, in my opinion, that that's what is generating uh, these outputs. Thank you. Next question. The paper on black box attacks is very interesting. If it is so easy for deep learning models to be fooled, what is the way forward? The other paper on adversarial defense showed the best worst case scenario on CFAR 10, but that is not very realistic. Do you want to take Absolutely. this? Absolutely. That's, that's also a great question. Uh, that's, that's why it's, it's interesting to dive into these papers. Uh, Sure, we, we, we are surrounded by all of these amazing uh, machine learning techniques, but only now, only in the recent years, we're starting to see their influence into the real world. We, then after, after putting them into production, into the real world, we're starting to realize they also have shortcomings. They can be tricked, they can be fooled. Surely they can be fooled. Surely deep learning models can be fooled, which is why we need to look into how can we prevent that uh, so we need to we need to look into more of these papers. CFAR is is a demo, small, solved, uh, arguably data set, but it serves a generic good example. And using these little tricks, with a few tweakings, uh, different adaptations, in my opinion, will eventually lead into these being used in the industry. Thank you, Sayam. Next question. It may not be directly related to these papers, but in general about generative models. Recently, we have seen many models generating human faces from Pulse to latest NVIDIA paper, NVAE. What are some of the real world applications of such models, especially VAEs? The VAE paper, I think they might be referring to, came out just yesterday. Uh, I'm yet to go through it. One of the interesting ones would be, uh, animated movies, uh, which is not an unethical use case. So uh, if you're trying to work from home, create a movie, you can use these models to generate a good looking character, a semantically good looking character for your movie, for your game. Uh, games currently model uh, these characters. This is just one of my <laughs> random tangents, but eventually I believe this would lead into creating generic characters for comics for uh, anime uh, series etc eventually now, i don't know if if these are being used currently anyway thank you uh, next is a comment on the paper on fashion influences uh, is there something more that you'd like to conclude about that particular paper I think uh, it, it it was a good overview of their approach uh, throughout the paper. The, the, the fact that you can also model 
different aspects of fashion over time across different cities uh, and that's that's not been explored properly was was uh, the reason i picked this paper and that is just to show you that if you try to find these everyday questions as well right how does an influencer's instagram in the us affect the fashion trends in new delhi uh, that can lead to interesting uh, results so that that's a generic uh, reason for picking that paper for me great and like so you mentioned he's available to discuss all of this offline too next question uh, any in interesting papers on reliable model interpretation techniques this year i'm not 100% sure if if i've uh, come come across any i, I might have missed I have not at least read any uh, interpretation based ones. Thank you, Sayam. That is the end of our questions. Do you have any concluding thoughts uh, before we wrap up? Uh, just thank you everyone for joining uh, on a Saturday morning, Friday evening. Uh, please feel free to find me anywhere. This was a very good, uh, but very generic, very jargon heavy overview. So I'm happy to dive into that. I know the questions were, uh, pretty intensive i didn't answer them in the full extent that i would like to so i i will be happy to take follow up questions as well offline wonderful thank you sayam and thank you to everybody who joined us today um, the like we mentioned earlier the presentation and the slides will be will be sent out shortly have a great rest of your day and evening